Okay, great. Uh, good morning uh, and welcome. I'm Eric Froworth from the Department of Education. Today we will be holding a meeting for the Advisory Council for Career and Technical Education. Before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Advisory Council, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that. We are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selective legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote senate at ledge.state.nh.us or call 603-271-3043. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all, note, all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under right to know law. At some point, I'm going to get used to reading that. Uh, <laughs> good morning. Uh, I'm Eric Froworth. Uh, I am in Manchester in my home office, and I'm alone with the exception of a couple dogs at my feet. And I'm just going to start working my way around based on how I see you in the boxes. So, Bruce, you're up first. And Bruce Fire, Principal, Lake Ridge Technology Center, here in my office by myself. Thank you. Roxy. Hi, I'm Roxy Severance. I'm in Whitefield, New Hampshire in my home. I will be transitioning to my car uh, and I am alone. Thank you. Representative Ladd. Rick Ladd's here in, in Haverhill, New Hampshire alone. Thank you. Al. Al Smith, Hugh Gallon Center in Littleton in my office alone. Thank you. Beth. Good morning, everyone. Beth Doran here at home uh, in Derry, New Hampshire. My husband is in the house wandering around somewhere with my dog. Thank you. Pete. Uh, Pete McNamara uh, in my office in Bow, New Hampshire. And good morning, everybody. Thank you. Senator Waters. It's uh, Senator Waters in Dover in this room alone. Morning. Vaso. Hi, this is Vaso Partinuri. I'm the director for the Milford uh, Applied Technology Center, and I am alone at home in Durham. Thank you. Val. Good morning. Val Zanchuk is in his office at Graphic Hast in Jaffrey, uh, all by himself. <laughs> Mike. Good morning. Uh, Mike Summers, the Lodging and Restaurant Association. I'm in my Concord office, and I am alone. Thank you. Will. Will Arvello, uh, representing Business and Economic Affairs. I am home alone. Thank you. And we have also some invited guests in the room with us. Nicole. Good morning, everyone. This is Nicole Highmark, representing NICTA and Reaching Higher New Hampshire. I am at home in my office alone, but have two remote learners in the house, so may have some interruptions. <laughs> Anne. Good morning. I'm Ann Fowler with the New Hampshire DOE. Um, I am in Concord alone in my office. Thank you. Jeff. Morning, everyone. Jeff Beard, uh, New Hampshire Department of Education, Bureau of Career Development. I'm in Amesbury, Massachusetts at my home, and I'm by myself. And it looks like Rob Malay is just zooming into us. Good morning, Rob. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. 
Could you do your who you are and where you are? I am Rob Malay. I am zooming in from my office at 193 Maple Avenue in Keene, New Hampshire. Thank you. And you have some nice tree, snowy trees behind you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Some fitting background looking at the forecast ahead of us. All right. Thank you. A couple more of my uh, office team may pop in at some point, but uh, this is our good group for now. Thank you. Uh, and uh, if we could, uh, Anne is a new face to the crowd. Uh, she's joined our staff as an ed consultant. Uh, Anne, if you could just do the, the quick 30 second elevator speech so they know who you are. Good morning. I'm Ann Fowler. I uh, came from Pelham High School as the Dean of Students. I just started about four weeks. This is my fourth week, I believe, here. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know everyone and seeing what we can do to help uh, the, from the sending school perspective on uh, increasing the enrollments in CD. Great. Thank you. Uh, and always my first ask of, do we have a volunteer note taker in the room? This is uh, Pete McNamara. I'd be happy to take notes today. Grateful you, that Pete. Pete is here. <laughs> <laughs> I think Roxy is also grateful that Pete is here. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, so I did send out with the agenda the minutes from the last meeting. Thank you, Roxy, for doing them. Uh, and uh, we'd like to open the floor if there are um, any, first off, if there are any, anybody noted any changes we need. Otherwise, I will ask for a motion to accept the minutes. I see. No, no changes. Uh, Senator Waters moved. Do I have a second? No second. Thank you. Now we'll go through quickly and do a vote again in this box order. Bruce? I vote in favor. Thank you. Rep Lad? Yes. Al? Vote in favor. Beth? Yes. Pete? Yes. Senator Waters? Yep. Val? Yes. Mike? Uh, I think I'm abstaining because I think I missed most of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Will? I'm abstaining as well. Thank you. Rob? Yes. Roxy? Yes. Basso? In favor. Thank you. Motion passed. Uh, minutes have been accepted. Will be added to our my library of official minutes from the meetings. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I did a little bit of the staffing update. Uh, the other piece to the staffing update is this Friday, our new work-based learning coordinator joins our office. Uh, her name is Nicole Levesque. Uh, she is currently a um, Voc Rehab. Uh, counselor. So she's just one floor below us in the office uh, at the DOE. So it's very nice. She has spent a number of her years prior to coming to uh, Voc Rehab working with a number of the uh, private placement agencies where she's worked to help uh, facilitate job placement for uh, people coming through the Voc Rehab style process. So she's very comfortable in that, uh, in the cold calling companies and finding out what their needs are and making the links. Uh, so we are very excited about her joining the team. I'm sorry that we're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul and stealing somebody out of Oak Rehab, uh, but it's great for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she will be on the on the um, January call. If you don't, if some of you don't meet her before then, she'll be joining us on the January call. Uh, next piece on the agenda is the draft bill updates. And I will pass this over to Senator Waters uh, to give us an update on where we stand with our education bills. Well, thank you so much, Eric, and um, welcome to our new member. And, and thank you, Eric, uh, for all your work on this, on this bill and uh, Jay Khan who chipped in as well. And Eric, I didn't know if you could do a screen share with the most recent version that you have, or if I could. Oh, if you have, um... Do you uh, do you have it available? If not, I'll pull it up. Yeah, it's not the it's not the newest version, but um, it's is the two seventy. It's the LSR two seventy version. So why don't you pull it up and then um, okay, 
And I'll start talking and then we can mention what was added. Okay. So um, this will be uh, fairly familiar to all of us in that it um, resulted from the presentation that Eric gave us about uh, several language changes that we would like to bring forward from the from the committee. And um, it also picks up some of the things that got caught up in the COVID last time about appointments to this body and to, to some others. Um, and so uh, I will just mention some of the main things. Um, there is language in here about the tuition and transportation to fund to the full state's commitment. And maybe Eric can talk a bit about that in a minute in terms of the financial implications. It does have the language in there about a right to a career in technical education. It'd be interesting to see what the response to that is. Um, it uh, includes private schools and homeschooling and the definition of sending schools. Um, it it uh, makes a clarification in the um, language over the renovation and uh, the renovation now is renovation, expansion, or replacement of career and technical education centers. Um, it also, as I said, changes the membership. Uh, this got caught up in the COVID last time. Um, and then, and here's where there's some additional language, is the uh, career and technical education courses and dual and concurrent enrollment program. And... Um, and uh, it also does a, a slight change to extend the repeal date for the tax credits program. It was set to sunset after uh, you know three or four years, and this extends that um, out as that program is now gaining some some traction. And Eric, if you want to, if you think it would be useful to scroll down here and to point to any of these things um, that were I mentioned in the summary, um, please. Do. The bold there uh, is often the added language, and then if there's a new paragraph, um, that won't be in bold, but it'll be noted as well. Sure. So, it, and again, this this paralleled almost exactly what we had been discussing the last couple of meetings. Uh, the private school or homeschooled was really a clarification. Um, the whole line is irrelevant uh, because the way the law was written. Um, a student's, their sending district was where they lived. But when charter schools, I guess, took prominence, it got added into the bill that if you attend a charter school, it's your home district. And so we, it was just the need to add private school or homeschool because we have recently had a lot of questions about it, especially because of COVID, that more students moved to private school or stayed home, but their attendance at CTE. Um, I love that this is the first line of the paragraph, the right to a career in technical education. <laughs> well, good luck, we'll see. <laughs> um, so the transportation, the full cost. Um, currently, and the three, our directors can talk to this very well. Uh, the way that the reimbursement is written currently, it is 10 cents per mile per student that the sending schools get reimbursed, regardless of the number of kids on the bus, but the bus costs the same. And so there are school districts that limit their participation in CTE, uh, especially when they have access to multiple centers because of the extensive cost of running multiple buses. And so by this, it will, it reimburses the full cost of transportation. Now, that being said, it, we're still working off of that same, same $9 million. So it will reduce the amount available for tuition potentially, uh, but it will halt the problem of, of a school saying we can't afford a bus. Uh, Eric, Eric, so in, the school district is responsible for providing transportation and paying the cost. And Eric, that's something that I, also, oh, yes. Question on that. Sure. Um, are you, do you know what um, the commissioner has put in his budget for this? For the upcoming? Yeah, for the, I, uh, the proposal related to this, because it, sure. it is, there is obviously, I, I don't remember what the calculation was, it three or four million, maybe? It's, it's, it's an extra, yes, it, it would be an extra two million to cover okay. the transportation and two million to cover the tuition, so it really was a four million total. I, I can find out, I think 
I think they put in the same nine million, but I can find out if they've upped it. Well, please do because, I, and I, I'll call them. Um, you know, we okay. have been this is conversation. If if he at least puts it in, mm -hmm. um, then it gives us something to work with. When it, okay, uh, if it doesn't make the governor's version, and um, mm -hmm. it it might be very tough to do otherwise. I know the constraints that the commissioners have been put under in the budget prep, but. Um, okay. If you could follow up on that, I guess I will try to as well. Okay, perfect. Um, and then we added this line that says something districts will be responsible for providing transportation uh, because that uh, prior to COVID, it was it came up periodically, but with COVID, it has come up more and more often now when a sending district goes fully remote students are no longer able to get to the CTE center because all busing has turned off. And adding this line in that the school districts are responsible for riding the bus and then getting reimbursed. Um, let's see. Uh, this was... Oh. Uh, this, part, this part of renovation, um, we have several CTE centers that actually don't have sending schools, but the way the law was written, one of the requirements of getting the renovation money was that they accept students from sending schools. And uh, I, I don't think anybody ever noticed that, but it was a good opportunity to pull that out. Uh, uh, this is adding a uh, counselor as an official member of this, uh, this board. And then for several of the other advisory councils, um, president of NHTI had been listed as the member and we altered that to be the chancellor of the community college system or designee, which may mean that Beth gets added to several more. Sorry about that, Beth. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, here, this was the line of uh, under dual enrollment that career and tech education courses, not just STEM or STEM related would, would qualify for the grant opportunity. And that was it. Uh, oh, and then I believe Senator Khan added a paragraph. Let me see. Um, oh, it, under the uh, beginning of September 2020, each school thereafter, um, high school fresh, uh, assess student career interests, document pathways. Uh, and he added a line at the end that said, school districts shall report the following annually. The number of students who complete CTE, the number of dual enrollment, concurrent enrollments, extended learning opportunities, work-based learning enrollments, and the number of career ready credentials awarded. as well as the number of students transferring in Board of Education approved Learn Everywhere alternative programs for granting credit leading to graduation. And so that, that line got added into, the, into this bill as well. Any questions for Senator Waters, but I think he grabbed a phone call, so he may not be able to answer right away. Um, quick question. We have sure. talked about the fact that this is going to cost uh, a lot more money and stuff like that. Do we have, we, we don't really have any control over that. So can we say that we're going to um, pay for all classes, even though they are not STEAM, without knowing that the funding is there? Did I miss something? I'm sorry. Uh, th no, that was the conversation we had with Beth, uh, I think, last meeting that yeah. um, even just with the STEM, they were already over. And I know that was a conversation going on. Uh, you are correct. That was a conversation. And Eric, it's my understanding. I don't think it's definite yet, but that um, the commissioner is putting in for 950 for 950,000, which is similar to what we've had in the past. 
mm -hmm. uh, for the next biennium. So that obviously wouldn't allow for anything other than STEM. Okay. So I will ask at the same time, Senator Waters, that I ask him about the 9 million for TNT, I will ask him about the dual enrollment credit scholarship mm -hmm. as well. And Eric, if I may, um, you know, the, the budget obviously is going to be the most complicated and difficult uh, activity of the legislature this session. It, I mean, it always is in the budget year. And um, it's, it's a long process and um, things change too. I mean, revenue estimates will change. The revenues aren't down as much as people had thought they would be. Um, will we get another round of funding from Washington? I think we probably will. Um, what's the, what's going to happen with the adequacy commission report? Um, so it's unfortunate we can't know, but I will say this, that if we pass a policy bill and are able to pass this, um, what will happen in the Senate is it probably will get tabled and be given to the finance committee as a direction to the finance committee when it gets the budget to try to do that. Um, now that doesn't mean the finance committee will do it, but that's just the, that's the process we're, we're in. Um, and I guess, Eric, one thing I would advise is that in your conversation with the commissioner, I mean, you know, from the perspective of our, our, our committee um, and sense of the economy, that little is, there's, there's little that's more important than career and technical education for getting ourselves out of this recession uh, from COVID and what we need to do to provide a, a workforce. Um, so that said, it is possible that there could be um, some discussion mm -hmm. with the commissioner and the governor about the funding that is likely to come through to the state and municipalities through the next federal act, um, that, the, that there is some conversation about whether that, how, that, how the money that's gonna go to the schools out of that might include the CTEs. And I bet Representative Ladd has something that he might have some thought about this process as well. Well, we, we, I, I do have some thoughts on it, uh, Senator Waters. Um, the, you, you've uh, put together the bill that we just discussed. There is another LSR that's been put forward and would come into the House. To me, this is a bill in which it addresses tuition and transportation for CTEs, but it does it through a, uh, a committee study. But the concept behind introducing this bill is to have a placeholder for CTE in education on, on the House side. So if we see uh, movement on your side in the Senate, and or if we don't see movement or if we see questions, th this other bill could be totally rebaked to reflect uh, moving forward with the issues that we've been discussing today. The LSR that I'm talking about is LSR 400. Uh, that is a one which establishes a committee to look specifically at this issue of tuition and transportation. And of the school districts which have these CTEs within their borders or boundaries, they do not receive anything to support the, the, the operations of that plant or facilitate the cost of staffing. So um, that's the, the concept that I'm working at on, on the other side of the wall, Senator. Well, thank you. and. Um... Rick, I tried to send you a, a draft of this earlier and it bounced and then it, because it's being redrafted, as soon as I get it back from OLS, I'll send it uh, to you for co-sponsorship. And if you want to send me 400, if that's not already signed, sealed and delivered, uh, please do. Yeah, but I'll do that. Thank you. I, I think this is just the way to go. Um, we have a bill in each body that uh, something could get done with. And um, obviously, as far as this LSR goes, that if some pieces get taken out during the process or whatever, there's lots of things in here that we just kind of need to do regardless of the language changes and, and so forth. So, you know, just the legislative process may be that the funding uh, questions get handled elsewhere, but the rest of the bill does what it's gonna do. 
Thank That's you. And I thank you. Thank you both for the, all the work on the bills. Um, it did, that does bring up another point that I neglected at the beginning with uh, staffing updates. Um, unfortunately, Representative Darty did not win his re-election re bid this year, uh, which means we are short a representative on uh, this committee. When I found out uh, that that had happened, when the counts had totaled, I did reach out to the Speaker of the House's office to find out just what the process was. They had let me know that yes, we were on the list uh, for him to name someone. Uh, and then unfortunately we received the news last week about the Speaker of the House. Uh, so I'm anticipating that our appointment will probably be a little delayed. Uh, Representative Ladd may know a little bit more about the workings as things are happening with committee assignments, but I'm imagining at some point in January, uh, we will get our, our second representative uh, appointed to this commission. And Eric, um, I have a couple of other legislative matters I'd like to bring up if, before we oh, move on. Sure. No, perfect. All right. And uh, I, I, one of these might be a little bit of a surprise to you, but, uh, you know, it just we're in our filing period and it's a scramble. But um, there's a couple of other bills that I have that uh, is asking, might potentially be asking something in the CTE system. I have a bill on um, environmental and outdoor recreation education. It would provide a variety of ways to increase environmental education offerings in the existing adequacy uh, structure with you know no new funding requirements, but just making some clarifications there. But then um, also uh, having the CTEs and the community college system look at developing programs, perhaps jointly on outdoor recreation education. It's such a huge industry in the state and the Granite Alliance was put together under, under, under Commissioner Caswell's office last uh, year and he has hopes of having some funding for the outdoor recreation office that was established in uh, business and, and economic affairs. So I think there's huge opportunity there uh, in outdoor education in, in general, as you, as you will see in the bill when you get it, but also in particular a potential role for the um, CTEs and the uh, community's college system. Um, similarly, um, there, uh, you know, with the um, uh, offshore wind coming along, and I have a rather large uh, procurement bill that is meant to help attract the industry to the state. And, um, you know, we've talked before about the issues about developing the workforce for offshore wind. Uh, it may become the largest industry in the state over the next several years. And so there needs to be a role for CTEs. And again, I, you know, renew the conversation if we could with the CTE centers that have programs related to it and uh, Great Bay Community College. And I hope that maybe we can get that conversation uh, ramped up again, because um, it's just gonna be important, not only for providing opportunities for CTE students, but also for encouraging the industry to come here because they have some confidence that we're gonna be able to develop a workforce for them. So just wanted to update on those two issues, Eric. Sure, thank you. And uh, I don't know if Al wants to jump in on the outdoor rec. We've actually, uh, we have already begun this conversation at our end in our office. And I know Al is working, I believe with CAST, yes? Yes, uh, we've been involved with uh, CAST and uh, Amanda. Remember Amanda, former CTE uh, director from Nashua area. Um, we, we uh, as you all know, probably heard me mention our, our bike tech program that has been here well, for about two years now, and uh, a lot of interest around it, a lot of interest around outdoor recreation. So we've been working with CAST and uh, some fellow CTE centers up north here uh, to develop a set of competencies and uh, really define uh, some of these programs. Uh, it, just working with Amanda last week, in fact, uh, she's uh, closing in on uh, completing her work with regard to uh, identifying those competencies and, and uh, credentials. So as soon as that is certainly completed, I'll forward that to Eric so we can forward it to all the members here. Thank you. And uh, thank Will, I know uh, it was a conversation I'd had with uh, Commissioner Caswell that we were hoping that when that office was in place, 
similar to how we did aviation, we are hoping to do something very similar with outdoor rec management and, and get several schools together with other state agencies to figure out what a program actually looks like uh, and then begin rolling it out. So just on, on that note, uh, Senator Waters, uh, are you uh, both on the offshore wind and on the outdoor recreation, are you working directly with uh, Commissioner Caswell? Just wanna make sure that yes. that uh, we're, we're in the loop on that, uh, particularly as, as uh, content begins, curriculum begins to get developed for, for these uh, pathways. Um, uh, thank you. Well, yes, uh, I am. And uh, Mark Liberté. Okay, is, Mark, good. Um, appointee to the Offshore Wind Commission and he's serving as the clerk and we have a steering committee on which he is on as, as well. So um, we're, we've got a lot of work to do, yeah. but extraordinary opportunity. The outdoor recreation education, you know, I knew there were activities underway and I've been working with the, um, the, the statewide group that put together the reports. Um, the LSR is 824 and I don't have a draft of it yet, um, but you will see that it is rather chock filled with ways for schools to use school funding, um, to use all kinds of mechanisms within the school building program um, to, to do outdoor um, outdoor education and then outdoor recreation education. And um, so when I have this, I want to circulate it because I'm sure you'll have a lot of ideas about what, what we could do. Um, I think it will be helpful to the CTEs and the community college system because this will put in statute a directive to um, look into this. So anyways, I, again, we'll, this will get spit out of OLS pretty soon, I'm sure, and uh, okay. I'll be able to share it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, can I add that um, I started my PhD at UNH five years ago and there was like one person doing experiential uh, outdoor education and there must be like eight now. So it's ramping up at the university level as well. All right. Um, I, and I know the next one will probably be a very hot button issue, uh, but school funding. Um, I'll do the quick one first, which is last Friday, uh, the finance committee approved New Hampshire to receive its first $10 million allotment of the $46 million charter school money that had been voted down multiple times. It did pass. Uh, so that that piece of the charter school legislation has moved forward. Um, and so that, uh, that funding is becoming available. It will fund two positions within the Department of Ed, as well as set up a grant uh, program opportunity for uh, three categories, new, new charter schools, current charter schools to expand themselves, and current charter schools to duplicate themselves. Uh, and so I don't know where it's going to go, uh, but I do know there are some CTE-related conversations happening around charter schools. Uh, and they stalled when the money didn't come in, and they will be ramping up again now that uh, the money is available. Um, and then the bigger piece is the report from the Adequacy Commission. We have two members joint with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to either or both of you if you'd like to talk a little bit about what happened. Oh, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. That was a nice deflate. That was very yeah, no, no, no. We, uh, well, let's talk about the, the CTE part of our adequacy. Uh, recommendations first. Um, Rick and Susan Heward uh, and I were on a, a subcommittee of the subcommittee to um, focus on the needs of CTE. And um, we, uh, we, we had a rather strong and continual uh, you know, argument in favor of CTE during the 10 months of the, of the group's existence, uh, the commission's existence, uh, you know, basically arguing, as you know, Eric, when you presented to us that, uh, you know, CTE is not well funded nor well regarded uh, by the state and that there really should be much more uh, effort put towards it. Uh, in our uh, committee report, the CTE subcommittee report, uh, we did uh, recommend passage of, of the, um, uh, the legis 
legislative changes that were discussed earlier today. We also uh, made an, an economic argument for the, uh, the value of CTE towards 65 by 25 and all the other workforce development needs uh, going forward and suggested that the state fully fund um, CTE much as Delaware funds its CTE program. Um, you know, a, uh, a bit of information that Eric passed on to us, which was included in the, uh, the adequacy commission or the school funding commission's final report. So we've, we've pushed for that. Um, and, you know, hopefully there's, there's, there's some opportunity for the funding and support and the philosophical support, not only the financial one, but the philosophical and, and workforce related support needed for CTE for the state to really fulfill its obligations and desires as far as a future workforce goes. So um, that was that was our big CTE push. I think Rick, you know, that pretty well summarizes it. Uh, also, I've got to be back. Not there's a rest. Oh shoot, did I lose it? Uh, no, you're here. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, that you summarized that up pretty well there, uh, Val. Uh, although, you know, I have some disappointment that we're still measuring adequacy through the traditional methods. Uh, that's through the achievement testing, the enrollment in, 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 in schools, the attendance, and the graduation rates. Uh, we have always been superlative in regard to the rest of the country in these three categories. We're above we're above average. We're close to Massachusetts when it comes to achievement, and they're at the top. And we're in the top four or five. My my concerns are that within our uh, adequacy statutory language, we have placed a number of indicators that are measures of accomplishing an adequate education. And career technical education is placed in a number of those indicators. So I, I was pushing strongly, and I know Val was as well, that to discern whether we're providing an adequate education in, in funding it correctly, we need to also have as an, a basic measure, uh, some indicator, which we do already have, that measures the number of kids going off on these career pathways from CTE centers that are prepared for the workforce and that will make help us arrive at this 65-25 issue uh, or objective. Um, whereas I, I quite frankly um, don't believe that by doing exactly what we're doing is going to move move the pendulum a whole lot in the direction that we're talking about here. So I think we have a long way to go in terms of how we're going to. Uh, hold the adequacy formula and those districts receiving these things accountable in terms of preparing kids for the workforce. We'll get there. We'll, we'll get, get there. there. Well, it, at least, in, yeah, at least in this, you know, report from the funding commission, we brought up the issues of, of CTE and, and very specifically uh, enumerated in our subcommittee report, all the things that Rick just said about, you know, the the amount of CTE um, that's in the the uh, uh, you know proof of of adequacy, but CTE is not funded to the level that it should be to match its importance in that. And I guess that's that's probably an opportunity for some new legislation, Rick. I don't know where to get some focus on that, but well, well, um, well Val, this is one of the reasons why. I was very much supportive of, a, of the other tact, of the input uh, uh, approach. I feel that CTE programming needs to be an input into adequacy. I think it has to be a part of basic costs. And right now it's not. We see all these other elements that are there as our base adequacy and then the differentiated aid as well. Yeah. So that's where I'm coming from. I think we need a healthy review of the base adequacy component. I don't believe due to some of the, the costs which the new formula is gonna to have to come up with that we're gonna see a whole lot of moving off the, our, our current funding formula, but we're going to have to certainly look at that formula because it is inadequate and it's not serving those, those poor uh, non-wealthy districts the way in those kids which these needs like CTE, uh, we're not we're not providing that within the formula. 
I'm going to push heavy for that to be incorporated into as an input into adequacy. The battle is not over. <laughs> no, it's not. And it will be heard in the education committee on the House side regularly from myself. Let, let us know when you need testimony. <laughs> Thanks, Val. <laughs> Representative Vlad and, and Val, thank you so much for your leadership here. Um, sometimes it's hard to see, but I think we're gaining some momentum and some traction for CTEs. We've been at it for what, about eight years now? Yeah. <laughs> efforts uh, with this, so the first study and now this advisory council. So um, I, I think we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Well, I, I can add, Senator, it, within the Republican Party, I've talked with a lot of people and a lot of people in leadership. Nobody has objected to our pushing career technical education. They all see this as business related, as uh, an avenue towards getting a skilled population. And so there is support, I believe, on both sides of the aisle for this. We just got to figure that, you know, the sweet spot to get this thing done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. De I definitely want to thank you both. And it was very nice reading through the report that not only did we, you know, initially it was I had seen the line that just mentioned in the report of CTE should be included funding, but then we had our own appendix. So that was very nice to see that. Uh, we, we raised the level of we had our own section in the report, and, and that alone says something that the commission uh, saw that funding CTE was valuable and, uh, and utilizing the Massachusetts model of, look, this is how our neighbor did it. They also had a Supreme Court ruling that said they needed to fix what they did and included CTE in their formula. Uh, I holds a lot of water in that you know, somebody else already did it and CTE was included. So now we need to follow suit. So, yeah. And, and, you know, we beat, Rick and I beat the drum through the, the length of the commission's uh, existence. And I, I think in the beginning, there were a lot of the commissioners who really didn't understand the impact and influence and value of CTE. And yet by the end, a lot of them in their summary discussions or comments were saying how much they recognize that, you know, of the importance of CTE. So, you know, it, it, it was an educational process within the commission too, to, to bring the, you know, the, the negligence of CTE in this state up in front of them to see, hey, you know, there are competing states that really recognize and fund this because they see the, the, the potential and value of CTE and, you know, as, as I commented when, when you were there, Eric, that, you know, we tend to fund it because we have to, not because we want to. Right. And um, th that's going to take some time. I'm, I'm glad to hear from, from Rick that there's, you know, broad support for recognizing the importance of CTE, whether we'll get to a Delaware-like funding level or something, I don't know. But if there's anything that we can do to improve the, the funding and recognition uh, and, and, you know, make it more accessible, it, it's going to be, it's going to be good for, for the state. Eric, um, within you, you, we briefly talked about this uh, grant of money, the 46 million of which we had 10 plus was approved the other day. Um, I, 10 million, I, I pushed hard. I, I had a chance to talk with several other folks which are on fiscal um, uh, before the meeting the other day. And I was hoping I'd hear people pushing for the concept that we could have a conversion charter within a high school that was a charter that focused on career technical education. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of schools, high schools in this state, which would love to have that singular program like Jeffrey has and to open up uh, CTE inside that high school, especially if they're offering a program which is not offered at the local center. Uh, so we're not going to duplicate efforts. We're going just to strengthen the whole process. I was hoping that some of that money could be allocated as a conversion charter that with the primary mission of CTE. Uh, yeah. I, I yeah. think that as a group, we ought to be pushing for there's more money in that pot mm -hmm. and trying to talk with the commissioner, with Frank, saying, hey, mm -hmm. you know, find a way to make this thing work. Yeah, I, and I agree. And I, I need to talk to Nate um, 
from one of the other bureaus in the department of ed to figure that out. But my understanding of conversion charters is that it would be the entire high school that flips to become a charter school. So I think the description of what you're talking about would actually just be a new charter school starting from the ground up, but I'm not sure if, if a school sort of split, like a high school splits itself in two, if that is counted as a conversion or if it's a new charter school. Uh, I can talk to him. Uh, regardless, it, it was, and that was sort of where that conversation around CTE came into play is, is that how we get CTE in traditional high schools is through the charter school dollars rather than uh, through the Perkins dollars. So that's what the question is. Absolutely. Eric, I think that's well, uh, well worth looking at because th there is a lot, a lot of um, um, historical data about um, the relative success or failure of bilocated mm -hmm. charter schools. In other words, charter yeah. schools that exist within pre-existing um, high schools. And uh, there's uh, the jury's still out on, on whether that's a good or bad thing, but it's well worth looking at closely just to make sure we're moving ahead, um, being well informed about it. Yeah. I may toss something in there um, that, you know, this conversation, Representative Vlad, I've, I've thought about and we've had, I've had it with the commissioner, um, with Eric's predecessor, and it's an interesting concept. And uh, I think that, you know, one thing I've been concerned about with it, uh, which I think is not an insolvable problem, but a couple of things. First, that we don't get much reporting at all from charter schools about what they're doing, outcomes, and so forth. And that, you know, I think in clear and technical ed, that is the particular issue because they have to come out and get their certificates and so on. But the other side of it is the faculty. Um, we're having hard enough time getting faculty as it is for CTEs. And, um, you know, the, the charter schools may or may not offer the kind of salary and benefits and pension package that tend to be pretty crucial for recruitment into the existing uh, CTE centers. And, um, and, and that's, that's tough because I know some people think of one of the purposes of the charter schools is to get away from, uh, well, basically, unionized workforce or workforce that could provide um, benefits and pension, um, and other other kinds of things. So, I mean, that's and that's that's uh, that's an, I think that's an important issue. So, you know, I, again, I think the concept is one that's really it could work, um, but there's you know, if we can't take care of a, of those two areas, it, I, I don't I wouldn't want this to be controversial, but it, it certainly okay. would be, and take care of those two areas. I think that is a more to come as this as this develops, and for sure. Uh, all right, um, I'd like to go around and uh, change it up a little bit this time and do some info updates from our industry partners. Uh, you know, not only are you important in general with what we do, but your lives, like our schools, have been thrown completely upside down. Uh, so if you, you know, wanted to give some updates, kind of where you're standing, as I know our centers are wondering, are our kids going to be able to do internships this spring? What do we have for job opportunities? Those kind of things. So, um, if we could do a round robin with our industry partners today. Sure. This is uh, Pete McNamara with the New Hampshire Auto Dealers Association. We've actually, uh, have a survey out to our members right now. Uh, one, just broadly, what's your involvement with the CT centers at high schools and also community colleges, um, but also would you be willing in light of what's going on with COVID uh, to do more work-based learning uh, at your shops with a local CTE student uh, or uh, a college student? Um, and then, so it's a yes, no answer, but then also I want to learn more about it. Um, so, so far we've gotten a fair number of responses and, and interest in it. So at least 14, 15 said, yes, we do want to uh, do some work-based learning in light of what's going on with COVID and we need to just start following up on that. Um, so certainly it's a big concern for us. We've also tried to, uh, in our relationship with uh, ASE, which is Automotive Service uh, Excellence, uh, but a national organization that license uh, technicians in eight different areas. They provide a lot of online uh, training either themselves directly or through uh, partners that they have with, it might be AC Delco, it might be General Motors, Toyota, et cetera. Uh, so we're tr trying to provide uh, those uh, opportunities for online training to the CT centers in New Hampshire, Maine and Vermont, 
uh, and also the community colleges. So that's some of what we're trying to do in, in light of what's going on with COVID. Great, thanks. Yeah, so that's that's good to know that you were sort of on the same page as the, if as schools are shutting down and the kids can't get there, if they can still do their work-based learning and, and demonstrate some of their competencies out at the shops, I know that'll take a little pressure off of our schools. So that's great, thank you. Yeah, and we're, I mean, we're definitely just concerned about our, how far are they gonna fall behind if, if they don't get that hands-on stuff. And, and I know all the trades uh, are, are definitely like that too, that hands-on is, is critical to it. So as much as possible, if we can provide some opportunities, we're gonna, we're gonna certainly push for it. Great, perfect, thank you. Mike? Yeah, hi. So, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, hospitality has taken a pretty serious hit this year. Um, I, I, we're certainly looking to continue with our uh, hospitality month in April, but frankly, uh, we're not too sure that that's actually going to happen. Um, we're certainly interested in continuing to partner with businesses, but I think the real challenge will be the school system. Um, we're, we're of the opinion that the school system is likely not going to allow kids out into uh, businesses, et cetera, until probably fall of next year. And I, th I think that's being optimistic, to be honest. So um, at this point, we're trying to find alternate ways to kind of reach folks, whether that's, you know, Amy's running a competition with a lot of culinary arts kids right now that is a, uh, it's like a gingerbread house, gingerbread cookie kind of a thing. And they're submitting uh, images, et cetera, doing some of this at home. So again, just trying to find creative ways to keep them engaged and, and continuing to use their skills. Um, you know, uh, kicking around ideas about how we may run uh, some level of a, a culinary competition. Uh, Pro Start for us usually takes place in March, but the national competition is not going to happen. So we're looking at potentially trying to do a an outdoor under a tent um, limited version of that at some time in like May, for example. So we're kicking around ideas uh, around all of that. But uh, I think, frankly, the next two or three months is the real, really telling part, right? That how quickly does the vaccine get produced and, and disseminated? How quickly do restrictions get lifted within the school systems? Um, you know, Amy is locked and loaded and ready to go visit schools, but that's not even an option. So, uh, so that's, that's certainly limited what, what we can do. So, um, you know, from an industry perspective, I think we are actually uh, pretty desperate right now for, for workers. Um, obviously, with all the news around, uh, you know, the desperate nature of this uh, current situation, a lot of folks just aren't comfortable coming out to work. So there is an awful lot of openings within the industry. But, um, you know, and, and, and then I, I take another look at this and I start to see businesses are closing. We're starting to see businesses take a quote unquote winter hibernation. So I think there's just a lot of uncertainty about what uh, the next three months for our industry really looks like. And so there are challenges ahead. And and frankly, if we don't get uh, some measure of, of aid from Congress here in the next, you know, call it 30 days, um, I, I think we're going to start to see some pretty dramatic losses within the industry. So um, hate to be the Debbie Downer of the group, but it's it's been a tough year. And uh, I'm amazed that we've done as well as we have to get here. The real, ch the real challenge is going to be to get through the end of March. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Thanks, Rob, without putting you on the spot, can I put you on the spot? Uh, as the superintendent in the room, could you talk a little bit about, you know, ability to go out? I know in the past it was, if parents were signing waivers, it was okay, but things have gotten a lot of, very different now. And so where, where would a school district stand on allowing kids into workplaces? So I think, I think for us, we'd be a lot more open to something like that. And we actually have, we shifted to remote learning after Thanksgiving with a few caveats, with a few exceptions. Um, you know, there are obviously some things that we are able to deliver remotely over, over a screen and there are other things that we are not able to do. Um, and most of that stems in two areas, special education and CTE. So if we're not able to deliver remote instruction, we're actually bringing kids in. Um, you know, so for special education, you can't do physical therapy through a screen. Um, occupational therapy through a, a screen. You can't teach a basic life skills course through a screen where they need to learn how to use different equipment, um, 
whether it's a washing machine or a dryer or, or whatever that case might be, we can't do that remotely. So we're bringing students in and they're, they're still going through the same screener. They're still adhering to the same safety protocols that they were prior to us shifting to remote. And the same applies for our CTE programs. We're unable to do the practical um, portion of the LNA program, for example. Um, you know, you just can't do that through a screen. Um, there, there are other programs that we're unable to replicate through a, a remote type of an environment. We're actually bringing students in um, because otherwise they're going to fall way too far behind with no opportunity to be able to make that up and they'll miss their chance for completer status um, certification, uh, meeting certification requirements and expectations. So we are still maintaining some level of on-site for things we're unable to deliver in a remote world. Um, and I think that's important. Um, I, I, I take some hits for that and, uh, and I get it, but um, at the same time, <clears throat> with regard to overall school safety and health and safety, um, being in a remote world right now is helping us to limit any type of exposure or spread. And so we're willing to continue those needs for on-site type of learning when it makes sense. If we're able to deliver it remotely, we will, but if we're not, we, we won't, we'll bring them in. Right. So if that makes sense to everyone, I mean, yeah. it makes sense to us anyway. <laughs> Maybe not to. No, it, and it did for us too. And and we we you know when I talked to my my counterparts in uh, Maine and Vermont, the question around that uh, letting them out to the workplace added another fold to that. And you know Vermont had started it with, um, you know basically it was a parent permission slip that they had to get the parent signature that as long as the business attested the fact they were following all of the CDC guidelines the business signed off and then the parent would say, yes, I'm okay or not okay with my child going and doing work-based learning. We'd considered it here in New Hampshire. We just never, it was never asked because everything just sort of stopped. But I think it's going to become an ask again this fall, this spring as things are half open, half closed. There may be an opportunity for somebody to go out to a restaurant where, you know, I'm hearing from the schools that a lot of them are not being closed down because of outbreaks at the school but the schools are shutting down because there's no teachers. Yeah. And so it isn't an outbreak problem, it's just a staffing problem. So the parents would be okay with the kid going to school or the parent would be okay with the kid going to work. They're wearing a mask, everybody's protecting. It was just a staffing problem. So if, if that's still the case, then it's good to know that our business partners would be willing to take the students as well. Yeah. And, you know, if I'm being completely honest, Eric, um, there's a lot of folks in our community who, who are a little upset with some of the um, statements from our state leadership with regard to there's no reason for schools to go to remote because they don't have an outbreak in them. And, and folks are like, well, that's kind of what we're trying to prevent. So for, for those statements to go out there, they're not being well received in our community. Um, I have the, had that conversation with the commissioner on multiple occasions yeah. when he has vented his frustration to me of why are the CTE centers or the schools closing? There's no outbreak. And I looked at him and I said, they have no teachers. I said, you know, Pinkerton told us there was one day, you know, out of 15 classes, she had what, seven teachers out, Nicole or something. You can't run a school when half your teachers are missing. And, yeah, well, uh, and I think the commissioner got it, but it, it took a long time to explain to him what was happening. It's two part. I mean, it's it's a staffing, it's a workforce issue because you've got procedures that you're following where folks have to quarantine and can't come into the building. That's definitely one of the driving factors. The other factor is that we want to prevent any type of outbreak. And so when we hear state leaders say, you don't have to shut down until there's an outbreak, you know, parents out here are like, that's what we want to avoid. You know, it's, you know, I don't care if you have all the safety procedures, we don't want to have an outbreak in our building. I don't want my kid going where there are more people. So, I mean, it's twofold. You're right. The workforce is one side of it, but the other side of it is also being safe. Mm -hmm. Nope, absolutely. So thank you. Rob, I'd like to thank you for your chosen words this morning. Um, CTE is, is unique in that forever, we very carefully have individualized our programs and our needs of kids. 
And COVID is one more example that we're very carefully looking at specific needs of kids, specific needs of programs and needs of business. Uh, we also still have some kids out, students out in work-based learning, very cautious, uh, matching up the businesses, the kids, and the needs of the programs and certifications, and are quietly going about it. Uh, but it, it is it's a moving target one day to another as the data changes um, and the needs change. So um, I think that's an asset that perhaps uh, – we should keep focusing on a little bright, a little brighter spotlight to it because it is something we simply do. Um, Mike, I, I think in education, uh, life is challenging right now, but I say that what's going on in your industry uh, makes our problems look small. Uh, and I hope that we can continue to support as you simply get through this somehow so we can provide you with a workforce. Uh, daunting to say the least to be in, in the hospitality industry right now. Yeah. And Eric, the only other thing that, you know, you touched upon was um, the safety procedures with, with different businesses when we place students into those opportunities. I would kind of relate that to the conversation with winter sports to some extent. You know, we know that there have been no outbreaks with high school sports through the fall. Um, that's been pretty well documented. We know that all of the outbreaks through sports came from outside organizations, um, and it's presumed because they don't have the same level of safety precautions that our high schools put into place. And so, you know, for us, we would prefer our students when we have opportunities for them to be in a safe environment, whether it's at a, a work-based learning experience, whether it's through sports, whether it's through special education, we just want to make sure that the safety measures are in place, um, you know, so we look at it, you know, all, all opportunities for students, whether, whether it's CTE, whether it's special education, whether it's co-curricular activities, whatever the case might be, we just want to make sure it's in a controlled and safe environment. All right. Thank you. Uh, Val, anything from, from your side of the industry that you can share? Yeah, yeah well, we've, we've had sort of a mixed response. Uh, since manufacturing was deemed essential back in March or April, most manufacturers have been operating all through the pandemic. Um, I think we're more affected by the economic problems as opposed to the uh, viral problems. Uh, for example, right, you know, down the road for me is New Hampshire ball bearings. Um, their, their business is down about 25 or 30% because most of their product goes into aircraft engines and, uh, that market is dead. So they've had layoffs two miles down the road, uh, at Millipur, they're looking to add almost 300 people, uh, because they're making, you know, components that are used in, in, you know, COVID, uh, you know, lab work. So, uh, there's a sort of a mixed bag, you know, our own business is down, uh, we're beginning to see some light um, starting first quarter next year, but we've been down about 25 or 30 percent since June. And uh, I think <clears throat> I think there's a mixed bag there. I mean, I was supposed to have an intern this year. The original feedback from the school was, well, uh, we don't want our students having an internship in a town different than the town they live in which is like, well, okay, you know, then they said, no, that, that doesn't hold. And so now they're not, they're not concerned about that. Uh, you know, and I've told them, you know, I'm happy to have kids in here. Uh, what is starting in, in Convat, what they've tried is, is this virtual internship. Um, and they started in the, in the, the medical field and, and uh, the way it works is, or the way they intended to work is like once per week, um, let's say every manufacturing CTE program <clears throat> would be able to um, join a uh, you know, virtual tour and visit at a factory. So we could have theoretically you know, 150 kids and teachers you know, on this virtual internship and every week it would be a different company so that there would still be some opportunity if the kids aren't working here, at least to see, you know, operations in different factories, um, you know, what are, what job opportunities we have here, what sort of skills we're looking for and whatever, just of a, a way to keep the kids engaged. Um, so it's not all, all classroom oriented. Um, we also talked about 
gap years as maybe, you know, with, with things still under all types of, of clouds, uh, even going into next, next year, if there's any kid in a CTE program that's thinking about going on to, to college or is not sure what they want to do, this is a great time to do, to do a gap year, you know, work for us for a year, make $40,000. If you decide to go to college after that, you've got a year of work experience and some money in your pocket. Um, so that the whole, you know, the whole concept of, uh, you know, a normal, you know, high school, college, whatever uh, pro progression may not make sense in today's world. So we just offer that as an opportunity. I wouldn't mind having, you know, a good CTE kid work for me only knowing it was for a year um, just to give them experience and, the, and to give us an opportunity to, to, you know, to put them to work and, and, and you know, prepare them for um, work with, with a much more intensive internship, if you want to call it that. Um, so I, th I think, you know, there needs to be some, you know, more inventive thinking about what to do in this situation. I told them also, I mean, if you had kids that can come to work, uh, even though they're remotely involved in school, you know, why not, why not send them our way? We'd be happy to take them on. We need people. We're having a hard time finding people right now. We, if we have a job opening, uh, we get a lot of applicants, most of whom are not qualified. And it's, it's really very, very difficult for us to find, you know, people to, to work, uh, you know, at, 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 our, at our place. It was difficult before. It's even more difficult now. Thanks. Um, Will, is there any perspective sort of from the state level on, on all this? Uh, thank you, Eric. <laughs> well, I mean, I, everything that Val has said and, and uh, Peter and, and Mike um, resonates. And obviously, from our perspective, it, it's the overall support of how do we, how do we support the workforce um, environment apparatus um, for, for the future. And, and there are a lot of different moving pieces to it. Um, I, I would start by saying that, um, and, and I think some of you are aware, which I think is, is supportive of SB 190 uh, uh, commission, um, the, the work that is happening on the side of the National Collaborative for Competency-Based Learning uh, and their efforts to work with the uh, New Hampshire uh, state uh, um, school administrators, and uh, as well as the New, uh, the New Hampshire uh, uh, NHCPE, um, which has in, both have endorsed a language that NCCBL has put forth to ensure that practically every student, uh, by the time they graduate high school, will be career ready. And and so, if you're not familiar with that, um, I would encourage you to to uh, Get acquainted with with uh, NCCBL, and that's that's run by Fred Bramante, and and uh, who's the founder, and Zanag Ibrahim, who's the chair of that group. Uh, I also sit on that group, and so there's there's an effort there um, that's that's been long standing to make sure again that every student or most every student in in New Hampshire graduating from high school graduates uh, ready to go to work. Um, and that complements, I think, the work of, of this commission. Uh, also, um, for those of you who don't know, and I and and um, would be of interest to you, uh, f the National Collaborative for, for uh, Competency-Based Learning has been issued the contract to do the 306s or revisions of the 306s, and so that is that is, as you know, a big deal, um, and uh, so minimum standards um, uh, as it relates to CTEs, I'm sure it, it, it plays, it's a big deal. And I would encourage uh, you also to get engaged with that process. And I know that uh, um, I, I had talked to Fred Bramante about it, who's gonna be the lead on this. And I encouraged him to, Val, I mentioned your name as a possibility for the, the advisory group uh, uh, around that, that effort. Yeah, um, yeah Fred's already called me, so. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. So, so th there's that. Um, there, there's also, uh, just to update you guys on I'm some of the. Meeting, yeah, if you want this, I have another meeting starting up at 11 o'clock too, so it's going to be a pretty busy day. Um, okay. Jim, one of the ways you can get hold of me too is by my cell phone. I'll give you that number for this afternoon. Okay, I'm sorry. 
uh, one of the other efforts that we're that I'm working on, <clears throat> uh, some of you are aware, is also the diversity and inclusion uh, efforts in New Hampshire. And really, the idea there is is um, thinking about workforce and thinking about diversifying workforce, and the need that we need to uh, both retain uh, and attract uh, new workforce to the state, but but um, thinking about the whole diversity and inclusion piece, which I think ultimately in uh, for us going down the road in five, 10 years um, is important. We need to be able to diversify our workforce because employers and Val, again, you could speak to this, you're an employer. Um, it really is critical for us to uh, attract more diversity because young people want to be in more diverse workforces. And if they don't, they're gonna leave New Hampshire to go to Boston and go to New York and that already happens. So we wanna retain those young workers in the state by bringing more diversity into the state. So that's that's uh, those are a couple of the things that we're working on. You mentioned uh, uh, Senator Waters. You mentioned obviously uh, offshore wind, outdoor recreation. Eric, you mentioned aviation at the beginning, which I'm interested to hear a little bit more about because that's another opportunity for CTEs to to work on on, on some really exciting new pathways and. Uh, um, and so I, th I think New Hampshire certainly can build some advantages as it relates to outdoor recreation, offshore wind and, and possibly aviation. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, all right, so let's, um, let's do our school round. Um, I'm gonna start with Vaso uh, and uh, you better talk about the NASA project. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Um so one day I got an email from Eric that said, oh, are you interested in participating in a NASA funded project? And my husband is a space physicist. Uh, he's a professor at UNH. So we speak uh, space physics here in our house. So I jumped at the opportunity. So I connected with the Krista McAuliffe and Shepard Discovered Center. And we've had three meetings already. And we have huge plans for uh, working with them. Our biotech program um, will be creating um, several types of um, um, exhibits, I guess I would say, uh, that um, um, will uh, concentrate on uh, things related to changes in uh, human physiology when in space. So what happens when you live in less gravity uh, what happens uh, when you live in uh, a less pressurized environment and all of those. And what we did is that we looked at all the students that are going to be in that class next semester and uh, cross-referenced what other ATC courses they have taken. So I have a list of students in that class that have taken, for example, engineering, which means that they know how to use CAD and they can create 3D models in their computers that we can 3D print as part of the exhibit. Um, we cross-reference students in um, precision machining, in um, marketing, because we want this to be aesthetically pleasing and uh, in construction so that uh, they can help us with building uh, some of the parts of this exhibit. We're so excited about this project. I can't even begin to describe it. So that's uh, something that's going on. And uh, we have another project, our engineering teacher and a student are working on a wheelchair program. They bought this um, broken down wheelchair on eBay and they are fixing it using our 3D printer and uh, they are going to donate it when it's done to um, one of the residential care programs in town. So both of these uh, teachers were interviewed by Rob Levy and we are expecting to see new stories about that. I think it, it warms my heart just thinking about both these projects, I'm so proud. And so that's part of the news, uh, that's the good news. Um, in CTE right now, and I speak for Milford, but we had a meeting on uh, Friday, all the directors together, and we spent um, two and a half hours talking about promoting our centers and our programs, because as you can imagine, not many kids this year were willing to take a hands-on course without the hands-on part. And uh, we are in remote right now. 
Uh, so that makes it even uh, more difficult. We are tracking, I have been tracking registrations since August 1st, more or less. And uh, I see the numbers going down. It's, um, it's been rough. I think many centers are experiencing this. Um, we are remote, but uh, I have a wonderful admin team at the high school who supports CTE very strongly. And so as a result in Milford, although we are remote, our labs are open. So um, each one of our students has the opportunity, they have to choose to come uh, once per week to come for a hands-on lab. And it's been a great success. Um, I went into our biotech program the other day and I was literally counting heads. I was worried that we might have one too many, but we were exactly on the limit for that room. Uh, so it's been going well, but uh, cases in Milford jumped from 27 to 103 last week. So I don't know what's gonna happen uh, in the near future. And um, in terms of uh, distance, we are one of the few schools that um, um, has a six foot distance instead of three. And that's because our uh, building is old and the classrooms are small. Uh, we really need to renovate. And uh, so we had our um, ATC students as a sign off and their parents sign a form that in the ATC classes for safety reasons uh, in construction, for example, and other places, the teachers need to be at a distance closer than six feet. We, we said three feet distance. At the same time, we've had two teachers that uh, had to be quarantined, thank God, uh, unnecessarily, but still they were out for two weeks. And um, we've had a teacher quit, and it's been an interesting situation in that respect. Um, we are very worried about last year, I'm not gonna lie. When you have um, typically a retention of 30 to 50%, and you have 15 students in your um, first course in the sequence, odds that you're gonna have the second one next semester or next year are low. So I'm worried about teachers becoming part-time because they don't have enough students. And I'm worried about the health of our programs and, and the whole center, to be honest with you. Um, we're also very worried about meeting competencies. Uh, one, uh, uh, two hours of hands-on experience per week is not helping us at all. Uh, so that's an issue. Um, our uh, manufacturing exploration and externship program, which was a gigantic success last year is floundering. Uh, we have six kids signed up for next semester and I, I think that will also go down. We have great industry partners that uh, want to support us and work with us, but the kids have to sign up. We can't make them sign up for that. Um, an interesting program that I would like to bring up is Chromebooks. We are a one-to-one -one, uh, school district, and that's fantastic unless you are a CTE center uh, because Chromebooks don't run any of the software that we need. They don't, you can't, um, they have very little memory, so you can't really install plugins and things like that. So um, our teachers had to be very, very, very creative uh, how do you teach CAD without SOLIDWORKS, without Inventor? How do you teach graphic art without, or, or video without Adobe? So it's been um, very, very interesting and um, very, um, I don't know what the word is. It's a good word, <laughs> uh, but challenging for, mo for everyone. Our teachers are exhausted. I'll be honest with you. Uh, and um, not only that, but union issues. Milford is a very strong, uh, has a very strong teachers union. Um, I would say that on an average day, the tail wags the dog in Milford and um, it's much worse now. Uh, and uh, another thing that we are very worried about is promoting to out of district schools. In the past, we would do presentations for counselors and things like that. And now all that will have to be reconfigured to do virtually, which is not impossible, but try to get uh, 20 people in the same room at the same time. And you see that that's a challenge on its own. And um, that's about it from Melford. 
Thanks, Voss. So, so, so with regard to the NASA project, just so you're aware, uh, so everybody's aware that uh, when they did reach out, um, the Discovery Center reached out, uh, the intent is for four schools to be involved. And uh, Vaso and Milford jumped on board immediately. They're still talking to three other CTE centers, but what they let me know was if it didn't look like it was gonna happen, I, I'm expecting either today or tomorrow a phone call, uh, there may be some additional openings for schools. We tried to distribute it around the region. So uh, we had one in the North Country, one on the Seacoast, one in the center and one in the Southwest, just so there were representatives of the whole state. So it is possible that there may be some more openings popping up. Uh, so for uh, for Al and Bruce, you may still get a phone call asking if you're interested in participating uh, in the project. What I can tell you is, you know, we're, uh, as things come through our office, one of the things we do try to do look at it from a couple ways. Um, one, we try to look at, you know, what school hasn't had some really cool opportunity going on that they've been promoted for to help spread the knowledge around these smaller centers around the state. Um, and then also we looked at programs, uh, you know, what program mix did they have? And NASA was very specific that they wanted to do this with maybe people that weren't in the science or the biotech because they wanted to get the marketing or the culinary students because the, the project could really be open-ended and it could be, what's it like to eat in space if it was a culinary themed project? Uh, so they will be looking for some really interesting ideas. And then uh, these projects will tour the state uh, they will, they're going to be looking at doing something at the state house with them, uh, at the science center, but then also within the towns that are represented by the CTE centers, if they can do something in public spaces, if not, uh, we're going to do it with the RV and our tent, uh, so we can do some outdoor exposition of these. So, uh, come April or May, we're hoping to have a really, really nice, uh, partnership with NASA for what's going on with this. So thanks for taking the lead on it, Vaso. Eric, uh, Eric, yeah. um, uh, I've heard Vass and, and you talk and Val. Val talked about a gap year. I just heard uh, in the conversation we've had that uh, participating participation is down in in some of our CTEs uh, due to COVID. Um, I'm concerned about these seniors that are on a career pathway towards this certification, and they may be competent in English and mathematics, but they haven't finish the competency route in terms of the career technical education. Are they going to be allowed to come back as a postgraduate uh, to finish up that pathway if they've been denied that opportunity during their senior year? Uh, so what I can tell you from, from our end is we're prepared to help out from a financial standpoint that if schools uh, next summer want to bring you know, the graduating seniors back in over the summer to meet up on the competencies, we're prepared to provide some grant, Perkins grant monies out there for the stipends for the teachers. Uh, so that we can certainly help on. Uh, I think you know, from, from a gap year standpoint, it may just become a spatial issue that yeah. could they come back in the fall? It, that just may be a space challenge. Uh, but again, that is something that, uh, that is an innovation grant from our end or a state leadership grant from our end that we can certainly help out uh, with stipends, uh, if that's what a challenge would be. Uh, are, so. are CTEs being informed that there may be some grant money out there for availability for these seniors? Uh, we talked a little bit about it before. I know Jeff had brought it up, but as the as the spring comes in, uh, that is something that we will let out let them know is to to what's available. But and it it will as as Bruce talked, it's going to become a very individualized piece that you may have a dozen kids in five different programs looking for diff needing different things. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I don't envy uh, the, the teachers and the directors trying to figure out what to do with those groups of students. Yeah, well, just, just a thought here, and maybe we look at a different model. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of seniors uh, upon graduation or hoping to graduate will work in the summer. Is there any way mm -hmm. for those, say, say uh, in the carpentry business or plumbing, electrical, is there any way for our students to be engaged, more like a co-op, and then our teachers be employed to support uh, those students on the job so they're earning some money as well as yep. earning their competencies? You, you just perfectly outlined an innovation grant, uh, which is what, that's what that money is for, is developing some form of innovative educational opportunity for students 
and how is it funded? And you know, what you're missing is the stipend for those teachers. And that's what the innovation grant can certainly cover. And I think it would benefit our teachers as well, being out in, in the yeah. workforce. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so, uh, so while we have you on the line, do you wanna do your, uh, your goods and bads? <laughs> <clears throat> well, the, the good is, well, it's, it's, it's a mixed blessing, I suppose, because we are remote. We've been remote since uh, Thanksgiving. Um, but I really want to, you know, kudos to our teachers trying to be really creative. And our students, we've had excellent participation. Uh, we're, you know, we're following a regular schedule, so to speak. And, you know, I, I go around and, you know, visit with teachers and students on Zoom or attend Zoom meetings. And, you know, our teachers have had 100% participation in most areas. So, you know, Students are eager to learn. So that's, that's really positive. Um, you know, obviously the flip side, people already mentioned the negative is not being allowed to be in the building. So right now in our remote model, no students are in the building. Uh, I think that's, that's definitely gonna change uh, as we pass through the holidays into the new year. So whatever, whatever uh, we come up with as a model, we'll, we'll be able to have CTE students in the building, which would be a huge benefit because, you know, the longer this goes on, the dis more disinterested students may become. But students are hanging in there, so that's a positive thing. I haven't seen any uh, major decrease in enrollment. Uh, definitely concerned, as Val mentioned, our uh, conversation on Friday with all directors is how do we recruit in this pandemic? So we're, we're brainstorming uh, ideas to do that, certainly. Um, what people may not know is our center works very closely with uh, the adult ed side and uh, students who have had difficulty perhaps completing their high school diploma. So we offer here classes at night and we've always had them interested or have them, uh, we've offered a course to hopefully have them interested in a career and technical offering. We've done um, Certainly manufacturing, we've, we've CNC, uh, we've done CAD, we've uh, 3D printing. And in January, we're gonna pilot, no pun intending, uh, a, a drone uh, component. So we're gonna have drones and uh, see how that works out with, it, with a certain population. And uh, the nice thing about it is we'll have some of our CTE teachers uh, taking those same classes so they'll be trained uh, to be able to teach moving forward. So if you see, you know, some positive enrollment or engagement around that, perhaps we'll uh, do something in the fall. Uh, so that's exciting, uh, something new. Um, but um, like everyone else, uh, just can't wait to get back to, uh, to normal, so to speak. Um, you know, and as far as um, you know, our work-based learning or internships, that's, that's presently down. Hope it picks up in the spring um, because I, I have more students interested in, in, in the spring. So well, hopefully uh, businesses will be able to receive those and uh, to move forward. Uh, I think like most people have a health science program, uh, really concerned about our students completing their clinicals. Uh, Elton Field, um, with the the good news happening, I guess starting today with the distribution of a vaccine. Hopefully, those doors will uh, open up a little bit when everybody feels uh, much safer. Um, but there's been some. I don't know if anybody else who has a health science program attended last week. Uh, Dartmouth put on uh, a, a virtual program for our students, which was, which is excellent, kind of a, a case study on um, someone who was involved in the motorcycle accident, walked through the various departments that this uh, young man had been involved with for over a year now. And it was quite interesting. So our, our students really uh, benefited from that. So you're seeing a lot of innovation um, that you know, who knows what's going to carry over when things start to get normal, but it, it, will, it will be exciting. And I just want to, I'll, I'll end with thanking everyone who 
has involved earlier presentations on on, on budgets and, and uh, because every year it's budget season for us here locally, trying to defend the cost of CTE. And uh, so I want to thank everyone for their work. Uh, it means a lot. Thanks, Al. And uh, what you were describing with the, the adult ed program, that's, that's a project that um, my counterpart, uh, Sarah, over in adult ed and I uh, are hoping to template and model. Um, we're referring to it as CT After Dark, right. as, uh, an opportunity for braided funding between what she has from WIO and adult ed funding and what we have with Perkins to offer some CTE coursework uh, afternoons and evenings at the CTE centers that could be populated by both adults and CTE and students who just may not been were able to do the CTE program during the day for whatever reason. Right. They could be they could be taking that same curriculum in the evening, um, but mixed in with adults who are career changing or just at some point finally decided I need to get my high school diploma and are involved in these CTE programs. So, um, so we've been watching you, Al. That um, it, it's uh, we're we're hoping to to template that to some of the. Some of the other adult ed learning centers around the state. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, you look at some of our at-risk students uh, who have difficulty during the day uh, when they're working side by side in a more adult population. Um, they really thrive. They really do well. So, so yeah. So we're hoping. So thank you. Uh, and. Uh, Al is going to be our second school to come on board with a dozen uh, Z-Space laptops. Uh, Portsmouth's, I, I think they're already shipped. They should be on their way to her now. And, uh, and Al just uh, submitted his grant request in um, potentially to use them with these students who are stuck at home that, uh, that need to keep up on some of their skills. So we're trying to support with technology as well, wherever we can. That's exciting. So, Bruce, what's happening in Wolfboro? Well, first of all, it's nice to hear uh, some optimism on Val. I appreciate that. And CTE at night would be a nice thing to uh, hear even more about because you're right, there's a role for that. Uh, I particularly feel that the 20 to 27 year olds that are out of school and now perhaps we could say are wiser than they were at 17, uh, if we could serve them better, uh, that's a missed target audience. Relative to CTE in my world, uh, I'd echo both comments, Al and Val. Uh, staff is, is getting shop worn. Uh, this is a tough road for all of us and to hold them together uh, and to let them know that perfect is not the objective, but the best we can of the objective is good. And what I continue to do, try to do is whatever I can keep off their plate is a good thing because uh, they, they have, they're flat out. There's just no question about it. And um, good soldiers. Uh, already looking at the post uh, COVID world, uh, this is going to come to an end. Next fall is coming. Uh, recruiting, uh, reaching out, is, is, is got a full attention. Uh, I'm not optimistic. There's plenty of room to be concerned about that, but we need to be doing what we can. I would say that on my radar, uh, more than just my radar, but all of us, is the academic failing behind of kids as well as the technical school falling behind. And credit recovery, uh, minimum standards, high school graduation requirements, things that are gonna drive our current sophomores and juniors and may well drive them away from CTE in the exact time when they should be getting involved with CTE because we are affected with helping some of these students pick up the skill sets in math and English. So I'm looking at a meeting with a, one of our high schools tomorrow morning. Uh, is there a role for CTE on credit recovery for the academic classes of math and English that may not be the same as other years, but COVID's not the same either. Uh, and to have these students take another makeup math class just to check off the box when we know they're not successful right now may not be the role, big role. But is there a way that we can look at doing credit recovery within this building? Um, needs to have a further conversation. So that's where our head right in, is right now. Thanks, Bruce. So, so we're all, it, we're always 
interested in innovative ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, and if, if it comes to that and, and again, if there's, you know, training needed or you're looking for some stipends, just let us know because, you know, that, that's the kind of thing should not be coming out of your traditional Perkins budget. If we can do something to help out with a small stipend from our end with an innovation grant, let us know. Thank you, Eric. And you say yep. small stipend. Uh, uh, we're still bound below 10,000. In other words, a full-time well, teacher is impossible. No, for the, for our, for the innovation grants, you know, that's, there's no necessarily, a, you know, a dollar figure attached to it. Uh, so, you know, if you put a proposal together and it's valid and we've got the funding for it, we're happy to fund it. And would that cross over this calendar year into next year? Yes, Jeff, Jeff's on, but we can, uh, because our Perkins money is a, is officially from the federal government, a two-year grant, we can roll between, you know, we can use it in the summer where it crosses between two different fiscal years. Just Alan Val, what I'm referring to is a possibility of embedding an academic teacher right in a CT class. Um, that's us. And that's a lot of money, quite frankly, but yep. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. What we could do is as we develop a cooperative project agreement for that grant, we'd figure out a reasonable project period. So if it makes sense for it to run from um, time period in the spring over the summer through to the fall, we can do that. The, 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 um, we're not constrained um, with a, an academic year for these grants. It, it's really whatever makes sense for the outcomes of the project. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Beth, thing, things going on at the colleges. Quite a bit, actually. Um, I'll start with Running Start. The good news with Running Start is that uh, we had about, or have, we're still sort of uh, muddling our way through it, um, about 6,800 enrollments thus far, uh, which you know we're, we're very pleased with. That's the good news. But the bad news is that it is down probably about 20% from last year, which we fully expected uh, for a couple different reasons. One being that uh, there were some teachers that, that said last spring that they didn't think they uh, would be teaching Running Start courses this fall because, you know, of the concerns that Vaso and, and you're all saying that, you know, they, they were unsure if they could meet the course objectives uh, of a college course. So we knew that uh, we'd have less teachers and less courses. In addition to that, we implemented a brand new, you know, in the midst of COVID uh, online registration system that quite frankly, I've been wanting to do for years. And the good news is, is that COVID pushed us into it, but it's been very um, hard. Uh, and I know it's been hard for the high schools as well. Um, it's a brand new system. And anytime, as you well know, for something, you know, to, to run 6,800 registrations through a brand new system that we literally uh, put together in two weeks that dual enroll, they have you know, quite a bit of experience with it. And they work with multiple colleges nationwide but it was new for us, you know, we were new to them. We have a lot of exceptions. It's like, you know, I say often, it's like learning the English language. Um, you know, we have, we have the STEM scholarship, we have the Chancellor's Office scholarship, we have high schools that pay for their students running stock courses, but some of them might only be $75. And, you know, every time we thought we had it figured out, there was another exception. So all of that taken into account, we're very pleased that we're only down 20%. Um, we're still working through it because uh, we, we did close registrations, as I believe you all know, uh, before Thanksgiving, and then gave parents some additional time to pay for uh, to pay for the students. So we're still trying to get the information to and from, and and now just ran into another glitch with emails coming out over the weekend as parents uh, get their credit card bills and see that there was a hold put on. Um, for a run, run, running start course and then that hold was released and then the hold was put on again. So for the high school people on this call, if, if you're hearing anything about that, the problem is, is that the hold is only put on for seven days for a credit card, that's all that's allowed. And then if we don't process the registration in time and get it back to dual enroll, then they, the hold gets taken off, but then it gets put on again. So in that process keeps happening until it's a done deal. So it's, it's you know, again, there's just been, um, Monkey wrench by you know by monkey wrench every, every way we turn, but we're we're nearing the end of it and we've learned a lot, and um, you know hopefully spring will be far smoother, and then by fall of next year we'll have uh, hopefully a fully integrated system uh, with dual enroll into our banner integration. Meaning right now 
nothing's really changed on our end. Uh, students are registering for these classes through dual enroll, and then dual enroll sends us the registration information and our registrars need to input it by hand. So nothing's changed in that respect. The only good news is, is they're not reading an application with the students writing that you know, is extremely hard to decipher. They're getting an actual report, so it's a little bit easier to enter the information, but it's still very manual and very intensive. Um, next year, next fall, it, we, well, if, if we do have full banner integration, what that means is that when the student registers in, dual, in the dual enroll system, it'll automatically integrate into Banner, which will remove all of that uh, need to do the hand entering and also the credit card payments and things of that sort will go through smoothly as well. So we'll get there, but um, you know we're happy that we were able to implement this system. Many of the high schools uh, took the advantage of just uh, looking at the recording that the running stock coordinators had done but they're now hearing from teachers, you know, despite us suggesting that we wanted to do Zoom calls um, and live Zoom calls so that students could ask questions and teachers could ask questions. Many opted just for the recording, but now many are saying, you're right, you know, we should have done the Zoom and we'll do that for spring. So I think that will help uh, alleviate a lot of the, you know, little errors that happened along the way. So for those two reasons, you know, we, we really expected what we got. And, um, you know, we've, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll only be looking up, I think, in, in spring for spring 20. Those registrations will be open. I think the date is January 18th or something like that. And whatever that, um, is it uh, President's Day? No, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, in January, right after that, registration will be open. We were going to hold it until February 1st, but many of the Running Star coordinators believe that the high schools would prefer to have it sooner rather than later. So it will be available, you know, as soon as your, your second semester starts. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, hopefully that'll all go fairly smoothly as far as getting our courses ready to be shown. I was interested in, in hearing the discussion this morning about the legislation and uh, including private schools in that legislation because we've really come up for a lot of questions this semester or this year, I should say, from private school students saying, you know, why aren't we eligible for the STEM scholarship? Because we, you know, with in conjunction with the our Department of Education legal counsel, our legal counsel, and them also, we're reading the legislation literally when it said school district. And you know, because because private schools do not have a, are not part of a school district, private school students were not eligible for the STEM scholarship. So. We've had a lot of people, a lot of pushback on that from parents saying, hey, I pay taxes, you know, my son or daughter should be able to get this. So I've been speaking with uh, the Department of Ed and discussing, you know, uh, the next time this comes up for legislation to include that. So it's good to, to include private schools. We, we have been allowing homeschooled students to take, um, use the STEM scholarship for early college courses because we just consider whatever their, wherever they live to be their school district. Um, but it's the private school students that, you know, are unable to utilize it for the Running Start courses. Um, questions on Running Start or STEM scholarship? So we really haven't uh, determined yet what the STEM scholarship funds look like as far as what we've been spending this year. But hopefully we, we should be okay. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens this fall and then may need to make adjustments for uh, spring, but based on what's available for our state funding, we, we are borrowing, I believe, from next year, or I don't, I mean, there's still discussions going on with the governor. I mean, that was the original intent, but I'm not sure what the final uh, decision is on that. But once we see what the total expenditures were, then we'll have a better sense going into spring. Uh, the Youth Apprenticeship Grant is, is is going along very, very well. We have about five or six, I think, schools that have returned their MOU. You have about 10 of them out there, and those are the 10 schools that said, yes, we're definitely interested in doing this. Um, and then we'll send another probably or so 10 out uh, after that. And we have a lot of businesses that are jumping on board, very, very excited about the opportunity. You know, businesses that we've had a hard time getting on board are much more excited to be on board with apprenticeship if high schools are involved, which is interesting, but um, good to hear. So um, we'll be start. I mean, you'll be seeing various apprenticeships starting to be pop up for those that um, you know are signing on. If we have businesses in your area, you know, we'll be in touch soon. But that program is still evolving, and 
And, uh, you know, we, we had based it on, as uh, Vaso had said, the the externship model at, uh, at Milford, but we're having problems, you know, the, the ability to get students out and do that pre-apprenticeship is really tough, you know, as you said, Vaso. So we may be looking at going directly into apprenticeships um, in a student's junior and senior year, they'd just be a part-time type basis versus, you know, something full-time. Um, what else? Oh, so Al mentioned um, talking about just various um, things got the, the, the actual event that Dartmouth Hitchcock did. So we met with Al and um, White Mountains Community College to talk about, and Roxy, to talk about a LNA to an LPN program, Youth Apprenticeship, which we're really excited about. We actually, Al, just had a call with um, Dartmouth Hitchcock last week too. And they're very interested in looking at a number of different youth apprenticeship programs. And Dartmouth is one uh, place that, you know, we've had a hard time working with uh, adult and adult apprenticeships because they really have their own programs, but very excited about working with us for youth apprenticeship. And uh, for those of you that may or may not know, you know, our LPN programs uh, started, one of them started in River Valley last January and has a year under its belt, very successful. That program now moved to Lakes Region. Uh, which will be starting this January. So we're talking about starting a program next January, January 2022, uh, up at White Mountains. And we'll look very closely at, and definitely we'll be doing a youth apprenticeship program, looking at uh, Littleton and Berlin to do an LNA to an LPN apprenticeship for high school students. So that's very, very exciting. We're, we're thrilled about it. And then, you know, the next leg would be uh, LNA to LPN to RN, which uh, LPN to RN is really easy because it's a natural progression. LNA to LPN isn't quite aligned, but um, with the youth apprenticeship, we'll be able to do that, you know, with a plan starting in place in this January so that we have it ready to go by the following January and we can start recruiting high school students in uh, summer and fall. So really excited about that. Stay tuned for, for more info on that. Um, that's really kind of it in a That's nutshell. It. As, as far as our colleges in general, you know, we've been planning at the under the advice of the governor since, you know, summertime to get students in to do lab work and finish up all lab related instruction by Thanksgiving. So we're all remote as well for the most part, 100%. You know, most of our, as I've mentioned before, our liberal arts courses and gen eds and things of that have been online and virtual from the beginning. But um, our lab-based courses are now, you know, pretty much done with the related instruction. Oh, and we're really excited about the auto apprenticeship that uh, we're working on with Pete uh, and the NHADA. Uh, we've got a couple of businesses that will be hiring uh, some, some new people and also doing some incumbents with an auto apprenticeship. And we're anxious and looking forward to uh, doing some work in the youth space for that as well. Bethy, do you, would you like to, you know, shortage of teachers we've talked about? Uh, what you've outlined in terms of teacher ed and then uh, partnership with the White Mountain Community College and Plymouth? So, I'm sorry, what's the question? The question, uh, the program with uh, teacher ed and recruiting teachers oh, with yeah, yeah, yeah. White Mountain Community College in Plymouth? So I'm not terribly familiar with that, Al. I don't, I don't really know what's going on with that. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you're, refer you're not referring to the... Um, the project that uh, we're doing with NHGI in White Mountains, are you? No, no, just uh, an opportunity that uh, for K-6 uh, teachers to uh, really get their uh, credentials and their bachelor's of education in three years. Oh, okay. So. Not familiar with that, I'll have to check into it. Yeah, talk to Chuck. It, we um, had a presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, very oh, cool. exciting. So I, I don't know how, um, well, I suppose we can talk about that later, Eric. I'm yep. just talking about the, the project that's going on with the CTE teachers and uh, NHGI. That's all I got. All right. Thank you, Beth. So it is, uh, you know, from our end, it's, it's, it is definitely exciting to see that the, in the midst of everything else, there's some really great new innovative things moving forward. And I think, Beth, you hit on it with the, uh, the online registration that you know COVID forced us to do a number of things that we had been talking to, about doing, and now we just have to do it. And I mean, right from the beginning, when we flipped to uh, remote or hybrid, Bruce, one of the first things Bruce said at a meeting was, 
we kind of like this flipped classroom thing and we're going to keep doing it even afterwards because it allows the students to spend more time in the lab if they're doing a lot more of the didactic work by themselves at home. So, um, so yeah, we, we ended up just taking everybody kicking and screaming into the world of, uh, of technology. So, um, so I just have the one other, other then I'll ask see if anybody else does. Uh, I shared out with, with this group, uh, the exciting opportunity that we've put out to all of our CTE centers with regard to the electric car. Uh, and what that program is, it is a kit that arrives from uh, this company and it's the, the metal tube frame that looks kind of like a um, dune buggy. And then all of the other components for the car come boxed, labeled, color-coded, et cetera. It comes with a full set of curriculum more than the classes need, as well as teacher training for the teachers. And the reason it comes with so much education is they don't know who's going to be teaching it. So if it's taught by an engineering teacher, they won't go as deep into the auto section of the instructions. If it's taught by an instruction teacher, they might not do quite as much electrical work as, it, but all of the information is there. They, as a company, they really like it when it's taught by multiple uh, disciplines. And it was when we first saw it, we thought this was a great opportunity for uh, this unknown third year. And, uh, you know, Chris used to talk about this with Salem is he's got a dozen kids who are seniors who finished the two year program, 10th and 11th grade. And they're seniors, but they're in seven different programs. So he can't run a class of third year auto students. He might have two auto kids and one marketing kid and figure out what to do with them. This would be a great opportunity for that senior capstone project for them to bring all their skills together. Or like Manchester is doing with the airplane, they embedded it right into the manufacturing program, but they brought a physics teacher in to co-teach that portion of the class. So we're, we put this out there as, how would you like to do it? You know, we're open to it. We're happy to, to throw some funding behind it. Um, we think we can fund three or four of them just with what we have with reserve grant set aside, uh, potentially more. I've reached out to a contact at Eversource to see if maybe they will come on board. Uh, I've also reached out to Drive Electric New Hampshire and um, NH Energy uh, Education Project, NEEP, to find out what they were. Uh, Pete, it was gonna be a separate call out to you to find out, are there any dealerships that are leaning towards that electric side? This is not something we normally train our kids to do. But if this is an opportunity where, you know, we could get kids to learn about it. So, uh, so we put it out there and once they buy the kit, once we buy the kit, the school does it at the end of the year, they take the whole thing apart, put it back in its pre-label boxes and then do it again the following year. So yes, it's a hefty investment of 40 to $50,000, but it's a one shot deal. And then they can keep using it. So we think that if we do three or four this year, Maybe we can do three or four more next year and eventually expand it out to as many schools that want this. Uh, with our goal that potentially in May, bring all the cars together out to the track uh, so they can all demonstrate what they've done. Uh, the, the schools have an opportunity that they can customize it. They can try to make it more energy efficient, more wind, wind uh, efficient. Uh, so it, it's gonna open up a lot of unique ideas for, uh, for innovations from the schools. And I already have uh, six schools that have said they're at least interested in finding out more about it. So we're real excited about that. Uh, does anybody have any others, other good things for the, for the good of the cause? Hey, Eric. Hi, Nicole. Yeah, this is just Nicole. Hello again, everyone. Um, I just, I, um, it was so meaningful to hear our director speak about um, both recruitment and marketing challenges and the work the association uh, is currently doing. And I just wanted to take a moment to paint the broader picture of, the, of that work um, so that this full uh, legislative work group um, understands what we're trying to push forward as a professional association. And honestly, you know, it was a consistent message here. We're all concerned about enrollments, but also just the general marketing of career and technical education. So on an association-wide basis or statewide basis, uh, NICTA 
is really trying to approach this in, in a strategic and, and practical way um, that really begins to look at branding, um, really common branding with consistent language and consistent messaging that moves away from um, the language heavy world of just education in general and ensuring that we use language that everybody understands but more importantly, really trying to communicate the value of career and technical education. And a number of states have done uh, marketing research um, on the branding of career and technical education and message testing to see what messages uh, resonate most strongly with student populations, so Generation uh, Z specifically as well as parent populations, because more and more we're finding different messaging strategies resonate with different audiences. And we need to be much more deliberate about how we deploy those messages to, to really communicate the value of career and technical education and the stories that we all have. So I suppose what I'm saying is um, there is this commitment on the part of NICTA to, to really embrace a, a statewide um, communication strategy around career and technical education. I believe it was Vaso who referenced Rob Levy. Um, NICTA is working very closely with a communication specialist, Rob, to assist us in, in our thinking and in our approach to this, this messaging. Um, and we are collecting a series of stories, um, really interest stories, student interest stories, teacher interest stories about career and technical education to really highlight and showcase the amazing work that's happening across our state. We are looking to begin that series uh, this month. Um, we have a draft story ready to go, and we felt very strongly it needed to begin with defining what career and technical education is as an avenue into some of these more narrowly focused um, interest stories. So I just wanted to share that for the good of the group and to be watchful and, and aware of that. And um, as we push these stories out, we certainly would ask for your assistance in, in sharing them with your networks. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, keeping an eye on the time, did, does anybody have anything else quick to share before I, uh, I will then ask for a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Um, Senator Waters, um, because of staffing issues uh, at the State House and the movement of Senate committees to Monday morning, we're gonna have to find a different time for our meeting. I just wanted to alert people to that and uh, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll be back to you. Okay, thank you. Yep, uh, you and I can touch base, come up with a couple time options and we'll send a, a survey monkey out, not a problem. Okay, uh, seeing nothing else, uh, if I could get a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Bruce. Uh, just, just a slow second. <laughs> oh no! Is it, no so we're now we're, we're now to you uh, to vote to approve. Yes? No? Uh, you mute. Bruce. Yes. Al, you're mute. Try it again. I approve. <laughs> Thank you, Al. I approve. Thank you, Beth. Yes. Rob. Aye. Val. Yes. Vaso. Yes. Pete. Yes. Representative Ladd. Yes. Senator Waters. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we are adjourned and uh, you all have Eric, a wonderful- Eric, before, before we adjourn, oh, just yes. a real quick tip for everyone. Oh, if you yeah. pull down your space bar, it unmutes you temporarily. Yeah. Ah, if you wonderful. didn't know that, there's your tip for the day. It's worked wonders for me. I just learned it Friday <laughs> and I've been using it the whole time. Perfect. Well, thank you. And Beth, I'll see you in about 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Have a great uh, holiday and New Year's. And we will be in touch about a new time and date for the January meeting. All right. Everybody take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you all.